All right, thanks everybody. Um, I just want to say, Tenzi, uh, hi, uh, friends and colleagues, and to our audience members. Um, welcome to our online programming for the exhibition on Beaded Ground. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, for a discussion on fostering Indigenous cultural practices through museum collections. Um, I'd first like to um, acknowledge and pay my respect to the Lekwungen speaking people on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships uh, with the land continue to this day. Um, my name is Laura Lee Wastesakut. I am an Inanusquayu. My people come from Peguas First Nation and York Factory in Manitoba. Uh, I grew up in Winnipeg and I moved here uh, 11 years ago. And I am so grateful to be here with all of you tonight um, and to live on these lands in this beautiful territory. Um, I wear many hats. I am a mother, a daughter, a sister, a friend and a community member. Um, but tonight I am the curator of uh, On Beaded Ground and uh, I am the curator of Indigenous Art and Engagement at the Legacy Art Gallery. Uh, for, this, for this evening's event, um, we will be joining artists Bev Kosky and Daphne Boye with Dr. Maureen Matthews, who is the Curator of Cultural Anthropology at the Manitoba Museum to discuss Indigenous beading and the role of museums in supporting Indigenous artists to connect with their histories through collections. This discussion will be moderated by Head of Exhibitions and Collections and Chief Curator at the Remai Modern, uh, Michelle Jakes. Um, and yes, Bev, Daphne, Michelle, Maureen, and um, thank you so much uh, again. I know I've said this a thousand times, but I really am excited for this conversation to happen this evening and for you all participating in the exhibition and the programming for On Beaded Ground. Um, and I'd also gratefully like to acknowledge the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria who has uh, been sponsoring our online programming for this exhibition. So thank you so much. Um, our event tonight is being live captioned by Ali Bosley. Um, thank you, Ali. Um, our program will run until uh, 8.30. And at about 8.15, I will take questions from the audience to present to the speakers. Um, and at this time, um, just, um, oh I, I, yeah, and at that same time, we will also be adding a, um, a survey. Uh, we'll link it in the chat and it would be wonderful to hear your comments and suggestions so we can continue to improve our programming. Um, so with that, I won't take up any more time. I will turn it over to our moderator and our guests to introduce themselves in more detail and share their thoughts with us on beading and museum collections. Jose. Thank you, Laura Lee. Um, we're not uh, going to take the, the sort of formal panel discussion approach where I read bios of, of everybody. We're going to allow people to introduce themselves in um, uh, the way that feels right for them. So I will just quickly introduce myself. Thank you so much, Laura Lee, for um, uh, uh, sharing my, my title with, with everybody. And um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to reconnect with this project. Um, because I was uh, sort of very intimately engaged in conversation with Laura Lee about beading for a very long time. And then I moved away from Lekwungen ter territory earlier this year um, and have been living on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis and the town known as Saskatoon since 
since February. So um, I miss Laura Lee very much. Luckily, I got to see the exhibition the last time I was there, even though I missed Laura Lee. Um, so um, I don't want to take up too much time because we really want to hear from the artists, but I did think that I would talk a little bit about um, uh, how I connect to this project and why I'm, I'm the moderator. Um, as I mentioned, um, Laura Lee and I have been talking about beading for a long time. And we started out uh, talking about it with our colleague, Eli Hurdle, who is the Indigenous curator at Open Space. And for quite a while, um, we would just sort of get together and dream about what a project could be that um, spanned our three institutions. And um, we always knew that, uh, that this exhibition that um, brought together contemporary beading and historical beading from the University of Victoria collections would be the um, highlight of the collaboration um, at Legacy Galleries. As things unfolded, um, Eli and, and I um, sort of moved on to other things and are connected to the project through this, through this public programming. And I know that we're both very happy for that connection. Um, but there was a uh, time not that long ago, even though it feels so long ago, when the three of us traveled to um, Winnipeg last February, just before COVID hit, to attend the beating symposium. Um, uh, Ziggy Minishin. Uh, and it was three or four incredible, incredible days looking at um, uh, beadwork collections and hearing from artists and curators who work with beading. Um, it's interesting because I was just looking at Laura Lee's pictures of this trip on Facebook and she took such beautiful images of individual works. And when I went to my phone, I realized that what I had taken pictures of was people looking at, <laughs> at the beadwork. Um, I mean, I just found that so fascinating and apropos of the topic that we're speaking about today, um, just how engaged and excited um, the attendees at the symposium were to be able to look closely at objects um, in a really special way because the curators and um, archivists brought things out and allowed us to put on the white gloves and touch things. So it was a really special experience. And um, I thought long and hard about whether to include these images with Laura Lee drinking a cup of coffee while looking at. <laughs> It's okay, it was, that's me beside her. <laughs> it, was, it was a special situation. The curator was there to make sure nothing happened. And um, I think that that um, Daphne is sort of in this picture in spirit too, if I'm not mistaken, that might be the moss bag that, that um, Daphne did a, a project um, about. And um, Something that, that we touched on a little bit uh, in our conversations planning for today was sort of the um, uh, global nature of uh, the production of beadwork. And um, uh, there's a beautiful uh, section in On Beaded Ground where um, our colleague Mel Branley has looked at um, beadwork from other parts of the world. And these are some objects that were collected in Kenya that are in the collection of the University of um, Winnipeg uh, Archives and Cultural Collections. And I personally am, of course, um, because of my own cultural heritage, really fascinated with beadwork from, from Africa. 
And uh, it's really quite fun because I've put this slide show together entirely from images on my phone. I tend to take lots of pictures of beadwork. And um, I thought that this image was an interesting link to um, to Bev's work, um, and as we as we uh, think about the topic we were assigned, um, fostering Indigenous cultural practices through museum collections, I'm also interested in hearing how the artists um, veer away from what they see in museums and and expand beyond and make things their own. And there is this. Um, uh, practice of covering objects in, uh, um, I think, particularly in South African uh, cultural production. And of course, um, oh, that's an old slide. Um, I'm going to skip over that. Whoops, I've lost some images. I think maybe I opened the wrong, um, the wrong slideshow. But in the interest of time, I think I'll just um, stop on this slide and and um think about ask us to all think about um bev's practice of covering objects and um i hope that bev will talk about the the kind of um multi multivarious things that she looks at when she develops the way she um she creates her beadwork so that's how i connect to the project. And um, that's what I've been thinking about as I've been anticipating this incredible conversation with um, uh, these three incredible um, uh, makers and curators and bead enthusiasts. And I'm going to um, stop there and pass things on. And I just realized, Laura Lee, I don't know if we have a particular order. Okay, well, that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, who, sh who would like to go first? Daphne or Bev? Bev? Yeah, I don't mind. Um, just to get it over with. I'm ner always nervous at these things. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, do you have my images? Uh, my name is Bev Kosky. Um, uh, my family's from uh, northwestern Ontario. Uh, my mother's from Lac Sewell. I grew up in uh, lots of little towns up there and Thunder Bay. And then I moved, uh, and went to art school in uh, around 1990 in Toronto. And I've been living away from there ever since. Uh, but it hasn't stopped me from looking at. Um, Lots of different kind of like historical images, uh, images that are in collections, images that are in the current media, like multimedia, little objects that are around, um, how would you call it, uh, commodifying, uh, little native, little trinkets and things for people to take home, little things that are, you know, vaguely like kind of racist and uncomfortable. And yet on the other side, some people think they're very cute. Um, and I started working at the Thunder Bay Art Gallery as an education assistant, assistant when I was about 15 years old. And at the time they had a collection of uh, native art and I don't believe it went back too far, but it had a lot of pieces um, from the local area. It had a large collection from, at the time it was the, Museum of Civilization. It's now the Museum of History. And uh, I, I just had a really good time working in the education department, learning about all these pieces, learning about the care of pieces, um, how museums get pieces, how they uh, have, uh, there wasn't a lot of repatriation going on again, but it's been kind of interesting to watch. And just think about, uh, you know, icons and symbols that are in and considered part of Native art. Um, I got really fascinated with um, beadwork, you know, always to look at, but at the time when, um, until I finished art school and I didn't really start beading until about 2007 or eight, because every time I tried it before, there was a quality of materials that I just, 
I was not comfortable working with and they were very frustrated to work with at the time. And, but I did feel such an affinity to collecting little tiny things and, and beads are just fascinating to me. So I took a lot of, um, a lot of uh, online classes, did a lot of research. I learned from an elder at the Native Canadian Centre um, named Mary Fox. And she told me how, how simple it is to cover the handle of an eagle feather. And I just kind of like picked up all these things from uh, lots of books, lots of library resources, um, started doing YouTube, watching lots of YouTube because there's so much out there. And eventually I started to collect the books, uh, actually buy them from my own personal library rather than borrowing them from the library because my fines were just as expensive as uh, me buying the books. So that's how I have a, a very, fairly nice collection of feed books and magazines. And I just love seeing all the different techniques, so the way different techniques have moved from all over the world, um, techniques that have kind of developed in kind of two separate areas, but also when the culture first develops the use of beads or putting, making something, putting a hole on it and wearing it or adorning it um, has always been fascinating uh, to me. Uh, so to get back on topic, so could you show the next slide? That was just a doodle of um, doodle of uh, sort of bandolier bags and drawings that I've I've done just sort of like practicing getting into recognizing patterns and copying patterns from beaver collections that I've seen. Uh, this uh, piece is one of my first largest bead embroidery pieces because I thought that that is something I wanted to do, and I sort of. Um, this was actually, I, I offered to do it for my aunt, uh, Lorraine, and we were discussing her colors because uh, she said that she had had her colors done um, through the elders, uh, through a ceremony or something. And I thought, okay, that, you know, that's pretty cool. So I decided that I would beat something for the back of her dress. And then at one point, I, I realized that I was working with the Ikea colors. <laughs> So it kind of made me laugh and it kind of made it easier to make the piece because there's such a like a seriousness around it but at the same time it, it really was the Ikea catalog Ikea colors at the time and I try to think of you know as beading as kind of like a funny meditative kind of thing that, um, that you try and create kind of entry points for people to talk about beading. It doesn't have to be like from a cultural view, just sort of like an all around kind of love of materials and patterns and making things. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So I got to do this residency in Banff. Uh, I'm gonna say 2012 or 10, I'm not sure. And one of the things I noticed in Banff was that it was, they were selling these kind of knickknacks. They were all over Toronto where I was living at the time. And I'd seen them all the time growing up and they're quite ridiculous. And um, in Banff, what was kind of interesting was that the Indian figures were kind of going slowly out of style and we were kind of like being replaced by bears and moose and deer and elk. So there would actually be, instead of like the Indian, um, nativity, like a native character, character, a nativity scene, there would be a bear having a Christmas scene and a nativity scene. So to me, that was kind of funny that, you know, we're sort of getting, you know, things are supposedly getting better on kind of like a, uh, like a sort of a, I don't want to call it like a, a racist, but kind of like a demeaning, your culture so cute, blah, 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 all that sort of talk around it. And, but then now we're, we're, they're actually like in a way they're admitting that yeah you are cute like bears and and uh, moose so uh, that was kind of interesting to me and I had about seven or eight weeks just to work with beads and these figurines and at the time I had started doing uh, bead weaving and bead weave for me bead weaving is um, basically just thread and beads and uh, bead embroidery is usually like thread beads and it's usually onto a surface. 
so for the next uh, series of bead, uh, beadwork I did, I think this is what's coming up next. I started working on covering up these figurines because I felt kind of like I want to hide them, but I still want to kind of remembrance that there's a shape and there's a figure and there's something that, you know, led to the point of these figures. So next slide. And so one of the things I had the chance to map is I brought all these little, you know, so-called NATO dolls and, uh, you know, kind of like really uncomfortable kind of objects and people do give them to me still. And uh, I decided to test out my Bedouin skills and that skills that um, stitch is called the right angle weave and you make these tiny little figure eights and you go and you go and you kind of ma match them all up and then you make this big netting. And then at some point I felt kind of like, uh oh, I don't think I should really cover the eyes because it would kind of give a focal point of what people were actually looking at. They kind of get to look out, you kind of get to peek in, but you don't get to see everything. And I kind of thought of it as kind of like protection and armor against sort of like all of these kind of thoughts and um, kind of like giving you the time to think about how these thoughts sort of affect you as a person, one as a person, and how you protect yourself from them, as well as kind of making an interesting object to look at. And it's a little bit to show off my beating skills as well, <laughs> which I really um, be, haven't noticed. I really do love to be. Um, so the final one is the next slide. And that's what she kind of looks at. Uh, these are also produced as large photographs. Um, there's a whole bunch of other images on the on uh, my website. So the next image, okay. This one, I got the chance to go to uh, Disneyland, California. And I found a prince, a box of Disney princesses. And that is uh, Pocahontas with her beautiful flowing hair as like this big plastic lump. Um, sort of giving the chance to look out, sort of like giving the chance to kind of, you know, be protected from what we think Pocahontas should be. And, and her actual history, we don't have time to get into that, is really quite interesting. Uh, next slide. So I got approached to uh, do some work um, for an exhibition by Lisa Myers with some other very talented, really, really talented um, beating artists. And uh, the Textile Museum always, intrigued me with beading because when I was beading any big you would bead larger pieces they really do have a sensation of that you're making a piece of fabric because the way that I approached this was that I was thinking about how colors and geometric um, colors kind of really sort really kind of stood out in my childhood because they, as you can tell that's either Karamat or Nikina one of these little tiny towns and there's so much dust and um, my mother was also uh, really good at sewing and sewed all of her own clothes and um, her my other aunts remember my mom wearing this dress in this kind of really gray dusty town um, and I was just a baby I'm kind of hiding behind her and so I worked through this whole series of about eight pieces um, based on different photographs and ideas and geometric patterns uh, next slide please and so that's my process of how I worked it out. I'm not 100% happy with it, but it was satisfying enough for what I wanted to do. That that pattern is um, hound's tooth. Uh, the next, the next uh, slide, please. And this is the final piece. So, you know, you can still see like there's still tiny little problems with it. But to me, actually getting to make that pattern of fabric that I see, and it really sticks out in a whole bunch of old historical family photographs. Um, and uh, I have a sweet one, a sweet photo of my aunt, um, her older sister, and her, I think her closest sisters, uh, a photo of her standing in front of it in the art gallery in Thunder Bay, which is really quite nice. And, you know, she told my cousin that she really remembers my mom wearing this dress and how she loved to sew and make things. And, it's nice to think that I'm doing that I'm doing the same thing in my own way. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I started, I think I took these from the Museum of Civilization website rather than the University of Victoria, but I could be wrong. And uh, what they are, they're just an example of uh, typical moccasins that you would see inside 
there any sort of like broad native uh, native uh, historical objects or art collection. And they've got the fur and it's an example, I think they call it the pucker toe or an Ojibwe style moccasin. I could be wrong. There's many different names for all of these. And in the um, sort of like the tongue area, that section uh, is called the vamp. And I was really intrigued with all these items in the Victoria, Art Gallery Victoria's um, legacy collection, because a lot of them were actually just unfinished and bits of beadwork that were actually too, in a weird way, kind of probably given as like a, a group of objects to the museum as I look from the, the collector's names. And also the fact that they were still kind of precious, even though they were just the disassembled objects. So like the, the tongue was out, there's some rosettes, there were some, um, there was a luggage tag in there, which was kind of interesting. Um, and that gave me the idea for this piece. So next piece, please. I thought about how those moccasins were constructed. It's always mystified me. I've been asked to teach it. And I just, I, I made one moccasin once and I gave up because there are so many more skilled people who can make moccasins that you're better off going to somebody who can, uh, who can do them. So I texted my friend, Jean. I said, Jean, do you have a pattern for a moccasin handy? She goes, yeah, yeah, I do. And she's, you know, modern technology and everything. Um, she said, here, I'll take a picture and I'll send it over to you. And so the item on the, the left is called a bamp and that's like the tongue of what sits on the toe. And that's generally where you put the pattern. And then in some kind of secret magical way that kind of wraps around becomes the rest of the moccasin. So to me, it was interesting how these two pieces could become a piece of footwear. And um, so I named this next series, uh, this next um, piece uh, disassembled and I made it for the, this exhibition on beaded ground. So you can see it up close uh, bit of the beadwork. Um, and the next and final image is the final piece. So that's approximately the size of a, a size eight or size, size nine moccasin pattern. So in theory, you could like, sew it up together, but I thought it's kind of mysterious because it kind of looks like a handbag, um, but other beaters would know, hey, or moccasin makers would know, those are moccasins, that's probably a moccasin pattern. So it kind of becomes like this little kind of um, craftsperson's kind of secret in a way. And it was kind of fun just portraying it as that. Okay, hope I didn't talk too long and that's it. Hey, um, will we go to, to Daphne next? That was wonderful, Bev. It's really um, so intriguing to hear you talk about your work in detail like that. It just uh, is, is mesmerizing. Your work is scrumptious and I, I so much wanted to touch it. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, it, it, we couldn't touch it. We, we couldn't get behind the plexiglass. <laughs> Um, but thank you for that. And also thank you to Laura Lee, Michelle, and also to Maureen. Hi, Maureen. Um, great to see you all here. Um, so um, let's see if Amy, can I get you to pull up my slides, please? And we'll start with some of these. Yeah. Um, I thought I'd talk mostly about my most recent works and um, start out by explaining that that recently I developed this technique. If we can move to the first slide, please, Amy. I de developed this technique that I called berries to beads, where um, actually there's two digital techniques that I've developed in the recent past. And one of them is berries to beads, where I take high resolution um, images of, of berries and um, I use them as beads. And the other technique is, is a quill work technique. So both of these, riff off of traditional uh, Métis handwork. I'm Métis, my, I come, my great grandma for whom this birthing tent was made that you're seeing here in front of us. Um, she was a, um, an indigenous midwife on the Northern Great Plains. 
she was born on a buffalo hunt and raised her kids, my grandma and her sisters in a on an outpost with her husband, with my great grandfather, who was a trapper and fur trader. So um, uh, my great grandma, Eleanor, was a, a very strong personality, loved to leave home. Um, I think probably she liked the role of a medicine woman rather than being a mom of five kids in a one bedroom uh, uh, little cottage with no running water and a wood stove. So she really loved to get off on her own and uh, be, she would move in with the, with the um, pregnant woman and often stay weeks or even a month or even longer and um, leaving her family at home. So, and I knew that she smoked a pipe. I actually have her glasses. I was going to bring them out and put them on for you, but I forgot. Sorry. Um, I have her glasses. Um, and um, she was um, she was really a larger than life character uh, when I was growing up. Um, I think my mother was quite afraid of her. And so a lot of stories uh, that my mom carried uh, talked about Eleanor and, and my mom's observations of her. And apparently she also used to nip from a bottle of vanilla, which my mom as a child didn't quite get the idea for, but we, we now we say that that was grandma's way of, of dealing with work-related stress, or great grandma. But anyway, so um, the work here, um, this one uses my berries to beads technique. And there's, this is a COVID representation of the birthing tent. And Laura Lee and, um, and, her, and her colleague, Roger Huffman, were really key to getting this work up. Um, it was printed in the UK during COVID. And Laura Lee, I don't know, she kept, she was just chilled throughout the whole thing, kept saying, oh, yeah, this is going to be fine. And I was lying awake at night worrying about whether, you know, whether my textiles would arrive and what would I do if they didn't. But anyway, I guess that's an artist's job is to be anxious and I tend to do it quite well. But um, so what I've done is with the help of a great technical team in Montreal, who I've worked with over the years to develop this, uh, this, these digital techniques, um, I, I, I put a uh, beaded, um, made a berries to bees uh, version of um, the ball and stick representation of the oxytocin molecule on the roof. And the reason I did that because, uh, is because oxytocin is really implicated in um, the birthing process for both the mother and the baby. And also because of the Métis community from which I, I come from, um, my ancestors were uh, founding members of the first Métis nation. One of them was um, Solomon Amelin, who I believe was one of the first leaders of the hunt uh, in um, the Red River District. So I wanted to represent the, um, the, the oxytocin molecule. So this is actually, with a slight bit of tweaking, an accurate representation of this very complex and beautiful molecule. Um, and the, I also wanted it to be represented as a constellation and also branching in this habit to really reflect the generational aspect of the story that I tell. You probably can't see this, but the background is, is um, a blueberries, so it sort of sparkles like a starry night, a little bit of imagination there. Uh, so, um, and, and the ribbons, the ribbons represent um, were inspired by ribbon skirts and uh, each of them represents uh, a, one of the children that my great grandma birthed. The original tent was meant to have walls. We couldn't put up, make an enclosed space uh, during COVID. So um, Laura Lee and Roger um, really bore up a lot with me as I was dragging my samples in and saying, which one should we go with? Honey, how are we going to hang these? They, they, so their hands are in this work everywhere, as are a number of other community members who helped um, do this wonderful, wonderful job. A friend helped. She cut the ribbons for me because I couldn't, didn't have the right scissors. If anybody ever was curious about how you cut fine silk, you need Japanese serrated scissors. Nothing else will work. And, um, and uh, a local um, a, a, a woman who runs a local uh, handmade clothing store, Trisha Comas, sewed the whole thing together. So I, I consider this my community project, and it's a miracle that it's up there. 
Um, but um, the ribbons are the designs on the ribbons because I work iteratively. The designs on the ribbons uh, are take elements from previous works, and they are slight. They're just, just tiny, discrete little elements that I see as being DNA, and then I, I I create a pattern using those little elements. And and one of these, a number of these designs reference the moss bag beading. Um, maybe we could just skip ahead and take a look. I'm not sure exactly when the moss. Oh, there's the first image of the moss bag beading, and you'll see Maureen's hand in this. So thank you, Maureen. Um, so what this is is um, I visited Maureen at the Manitoba Museum. I think I'm not exactly sure what year it was. Maybe 2015 or 2016. I only became a, um, a full-time artist late in life, and so 2016 I think was the year that I started making art full-time. And shortly after that, I visited Maureen, and she showed me the collection of works uh, in the archives, Métis works, and I fell in love with the moss bag. Really fell in love with it. I couldn't get it out of my mind, and um, decided that um, I wanted to bead a number of the components. So I started out with the larger flowers in the design, very much recognizing those floral designs from my childhood. Um, my, I, I spent time uh, in public school in Meadow Lake, and um, which just north of there, Maureen, when I was growing up, was had rock star status because she started one of the first um, Cree language TV stations, and I knew about her at the time and never really dreamt that I'd be working with her. So um, this was a real privilege. But um, anyway, the, the, this beading project took off. Um, I ended up um, over probably 18 months or a year two years beating beating the whole thing and so this is very technical We're, it's done online we have a really fine grid and we um i'm working with the team and we bead you know the square one a column a square two column you know it's so technical it's absolutely crazy and then once it was done i i thought well who was the original person to have made this work and um, I knew that this was um, um, typical Métis beading, and I know that knew that Maureen had said that she had come from the subarctic area. And so, with a, with Maureen's help, we set out and found other pieces that were uh, that were made by her hand, and ultimately found out that she was a Métis Dene. And I know that many of the Métis people. Um, when, when after the rebellion left the Red River District and, and, and scattered all over. And I know that, that there, is, there was quite a community around Athabasca, which is um, Lake Athabasca, which is where she apparently is from. There's, some of her works are in the uh, National Museum of the American Indian and also in, at the McCord Museum in Montreal. So I ended up making, with the assistance of a Métis sister, uh, we made a video to go with the work that talks about my attachment to the work and how these floral designs were very reminiscent of what my grandma and my um, um, my adopted grandma wore on, in their house dresses, and they appeared also in my public school when we wore moccasins, many smoke tan moccasins, uh, many of us wore those to school even though at the time um, in my family, my mother, my mother claimed our Métis history and my grandmother vehemently de denied it, even though um, she, had, she spoke Michif, she spoke Cree, she'd worked as a, an interpreter, language interpreter in that outpost where she was raised. Um, she had sweet grass in her glove compartment um, and she spoke with a very strong um, Métis accent. So she was, um, she, Clemence internalized the racism that was around her and she did it to keep her kids safe. So, um, you know, I understand it now. I didn't, when I was a kid, I felt resentful for her doing that, but I certainly understand why she did it now. So I'm not sure, can we move on to the next slide? And then I should be watching my time. You get a bit of a picture here for the beating of the, of the um, canopy. 
Um, and some of the ribbons, whoops, lots of noise outside my studio, sorry. So uh, there is a one ribbon in here that is um, uh, actually honors my mom. Um, uh, my mom was a 45 year practitioner of yoga and uh, for as far fetched as it sounds, she actually died in a yoga posture and she had a wonderful end of life. So um, my sister who is a yoga teacher led her out in what's called Shavasana. And, um, and then all of a sudden all this art started moving through me and uh, I don't know it's a bit of a mystery but uh, things have taken off for me artistically um, I'm um, I always wanted to be an artist and I certainly I uh, didn't think at the age of 66 I would be doing this so can we move on to uh, another slide yeah so there we see both works we see the moss bag in the background and the um, the, the tent birthing tent in the foreground and next slide, please, Amy. And there's a close-up of the moss bag. So the beauty of the the beauty of the uh, these techniques, these digital techniques, is they're scalable, and I really love that that aspect. So each of these individual beads that looks like a bead is actually a photograph of a berry can be enlarged to the size of your head. So the works can be huge. I haven't yet made a piece that big, but um, we've certain I've certainly made uh, bigger versions of the individual components because I really like to work with the scale and I like to make the story big and flashy and maybe we can move on to the next slide please so there's an illustration of a bigger I think this one's 48 by 48 um, it, this is printed on textile as well next slide please Amy and here we have a version of the, qu the quill. Um, this one uh, is, it represents, it is my first mural, one of my first murals, and it is made with the photographic version of quill work. It represents, um, when I was growing up, we spent time, we lived in the southern Saskatchewan and then ultimately moved to Meadow Lake. But when we were younger, we would travel to see my grandmother, who was also married to a Métis man at that time, her second husband. And outside of, um, not too far from their home, people, Indigenous people would have their um, summer camps. So they would live in teepees, they would be um, travel in horse-drawn carriages, and they would wear the dresses that my grandma wore, the house dresses, the women wore them, and they would have their, uh, you know, live on the land in the summer. And I made this work in honor of my grandmother and thinking that, imagining that the hole in the center is like a TP hole, but it also is an eye. So it's called Fort Clemence, um, great grandma Clemence for that part of her that she could she never claimed that she it, she uh, it, she was very much it was she embodied it but she never claimed it and clemence was um a rather prickly uh, personality she'd had 15 children of her own and then raised 10 more of uh, other people's children so by the time i came along she was pretty much done with kids and um, really didn't have much time for me <laughs> But we we were raised to honor our elders. So um, yeah, I was the one that was assigned to write to grandma every month, which I did for many, many years, regardless of whether she responded or not. But um, she was a phenomenal character and um, uh, really uh, an incredibly strong woman. She, um, I don't know how she ended up with a 1967 Mustang, but I don't know whether she won it and she was a big time into gaming, but whether she won it or whether she bought it, but she drove that car in the Meadow Lake area for many years without a license and she was a menace on the road, people would actually pull over when they saw her coming and she sold Avon and would deliver it to her her cl her clients on the reserve and uh, everybody had cleared the road when they saw Clemence coming but she also would take the keys her son was a lawyer in the in this town Meadow Lake and she would take the keys park the car in front of the constabulary the RCMP's constabulary take the keys into the receptionist and leave them at the front desk and say keep an eye on my car while I go and do my shopping so she my grandma had a lot of uh, she was very brazen and very she she did things her way so it's, uh, I hope I got a little bit of that in me. It'll serve me well going forward. Can we see the next slide, please, Amy? 
So this is another um, way that I've used the um, the, the the ribbons on. Um, uh, this was for a show recently at the Dunlop Gallery in Regina. Uh, th the beauty of the digital images is I can print them on many different substrates, and I, and like I said, I can scale them up or scale them down. The second row in. Um, is um, our medicinal plants that my that, that Eleanor, my great grandma, would have used, as well as the one on the far left, which is a pin cherry. Um, the design in the middle, the blue and purple one, for me represents either a scraper used to tan hides or a hoe. Um, by the time I came along, it would have been more of a hoe. Um, we had huge gardens as I was growing up. Uh, I, I think I forgot to mention that I'm trained as a plant scientist, and that is how I, um, you know, when I was a kid, I, we had large gardens. My mother raised us with herbs, so I went on to become a plant scientist, and my way into art was really through plants, and I use plants to tell human stories. Uh, there aren't any people in my, my artwork, but there's lots of stories, human stories in them. Could we move on to the next one, please? So this is a, um, um, a another mural that I made with Sébastien Aubin, again for the Dunlop. It riffs off of a previous work I made called All of My Relations. Um, and the, the, the um, panel on the left uh, reflects uh, the animal world and the one on the right, um, the, the plant and, and bird and world as well as the modes of transportation used by uh, indigenous people on the prairies where I grew up to until the age of 24. Next slide, please. Oh, there we are, the end. <laughs> so yeah, I guess that's it. We'll wrap up there. I hope I didn't talk too long. Thank you um, so much to both of the artists for sharing so generously about the work that you've included in the exhibition and a little bit more about uh, your broader practice. And I feel like I know both of your families really well now too. <laughs> so thank you for your generosity. And um, now we will hear from Dr. Maureen Matthews, who um, uh, joins us. Are you in Winnipeg as we speak? Yes, I am in Winnipeg, but I come from Saskatoon. So I grew up uh, across the river from your art gallery. And I was a very big fan of the Mendel for many, many years. And uh, I'm pretty sure it was when my brother was working at the Mendel that he met Daphne in the first place. That was when we were all teenagers. <laughs> anyway, um, I, uh, uh, I love Saskatoon. And um, I think you're really lucky to be able to be there. Um, and um, uh, so I, um, I was a journalist for a really long time, as Daphne hinted at, and um, it wasn't until quite late in the game I became an anthropologist. And um, so I've only been at the museum, the Manitoba Museum, for 10 years, but I, in the midst of time, I studied fine art. And um, uh, it's... Uh, it's like a practice and a way of thinking about the world that you never lose. You, if you train as an artist, well, for one thing, nobody can ever tell you you're done until you think you're done. <laughs> but also, you just learn to look. You learn to look at things and you learn to look at them hard, but also warmly and um, in a generous way. And um, and I've always thought of um, artists, teachers, you know, as you know, like they, they, they do something in the room. And when I went to study anthropology, I uh, found an anthropologist that helped me with my work, um, the fellow named Alfred Jell, whose work was about, you know, kind of as an anthropologist, figuring out the art of other people. And his theory was that, you know, you don't need to call it art. It really is a bad idea to impose the kind of colonial project of art on other people's stuff, you know, draw it in. But everybody has art. And the thing that distinguishes it is that when it's in the room, it does something. 
And um, these objects are active. They're socially active. They, they cause things to happen. So I wrote about that. I wrote about ceremonial objects when I did my thesis. But I, uh, I really came to realize that um, this way of thinking about objects um, perfectly matched the, the way that the Anishinaabe people and the Cree people that I had worked with talk about them. They, uh, many of the ceremonial objects that are in our museum are grammatically animate. They are spoken of as if they are alive. And um, as everybody who does beadwork knows, the beads are alive. You have to speak to them. You have to be nice and you have to be in a good mood or it will not work. You have to uh, ask them to help you. And so the practice of beading isn't just art in that very traditional sense. It's art which involves these objects which speak. And one of the things that's created is objects that speak. So, so I'm lucky, I'm at the museum, the Manitoba Museum, and I have a very large collection of beadwork. I have beadwork that allows me to, um, like, what well, I don't know, I think we have 20 saddles, 20 Métis saddles. So there's enough saddles that if you get them all out and you just look at them all, you can see the time when the tiny beads were used and the and the beading was right on the moose hide or elk hide, whatever it is. And it was like you just run your hand over it and you can feel the, the um, sinew. It's really prickly. And um, some of that beading, I'm sure that those saddles were set, were ridden on for 50 years before they were sold and became part of the museum's collection. Very tough. And then there's a period where people put sort of frame the beading in white panels and uh, with white beads around them. And then, and then they make beadwork patches that which they sew onto the saddles. It's, you can, you can actually see a trajectory of art development and art experience in it. And so um, anyway, I just, I, I think we are incredibly lucky to have this range of beadwork, this beautiful stuff. And so, um, so right from the very beginning of my time at the museum, I have brought artists into the uh, studio, into the, into the labs to look, to help me look at the beadwork and to um, um, use them as teachers. We've had beadwork workshops at the museum. We have had, we hosted that beading symposium you're talking about. Yeah, you showed a picture of me showing beadwork to the, those artists. I, I was so happy to see that. And that was a fantastic event. Um, and But um, so um, I, the way that I have organized it at the museum is that I have a scholars, in re, an Indigenous Scholars in Residence project. And um, a person has to be doing a master's in and for the artists that would be doing an MFA, I have one this year who's a Métis uh, embroiderer and quill worker. And, um, and they, it, it's a professor-student pair. And uh, so the professor in this case is Catherine Boyer, who is a former scholar in residence at the museum and now professor of art at the Manitoba Museum. And the two of them have to agree to come to the museum and consider the collection to be a research object to be something that they can learn from. And uh, they can do anything. When Catherine was there, she she replicated a piece of missing beading. It was a wonderful project. I'll show you a picture later. <clears throat> but um, as I've done this project now for seven years with all these different artists coming and with, I actually, it's it can be scholars in any subject. I have a lawyer and a Métis artist at this present time. I have had two artists at the same time. I've had, um, well, I've, I've had a lot of Native Studies students doing political stuff. I've had a bunch of lawyers. It's, it, um, but but uh, when the artists are there, and even, even if it's law, you know, there's, in history, uh, it, most of the sources of historical information are write, written, and it's men who write. But when you get into a collection full of beading, it, you cannot evade the fact of the women. You can't escape the notion of them putting all that love into that work you, and all that pride. You, you can't evade the, the notion of them having had, at the time that that beadwork was made, 
a lifestyle that allowed for the luxury of art production and um, really, really changes how people imagine the past. So, um, so anyway, um, I'll sh just show you a few slides. I don't, and I, I'll just make sure this works, uh, but this is set up. Uh, now, can you see that? Um, can you see a, a picture of uh, the moss bag that yes, we've been talking yes, about? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So this is the famous moss bag. This is the actual beaded one. And um, um, so everybody loves this moss bag. And uh, um, I finally got it on display now so that you can just walk into the museum and see it. Yeah. But uh, it... it um, one of the reasons that it's so stunning is because we have other moss bags in the museum. And when you put them together, you realize that this person was a, a fabulous beater. If you if you run your hands over this beating, it's smooth. It, it's supple. Uh, you know, if people are not experienced beaters, they, the beads kind of jam up and they can't be, they, they, they have lumps in them and so on. This is beautiful, flat really even beating and um and the designs in it are so incredibly complex now can i actually advance this let's see no i can't um i might have to i think i just have to stop this and uh, now anyway I'm back again so 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 anyway the the the, the flowers uh, should I be able to do a PowerPoint and just have the, is Amy there? Maybe not. Um, you should be able to. Um, oh, there, there it changed. Okay, I've got it back again. I'll, I'll just bring this one up. This is, uh, now can you see that flower? No. That beaded, beaded flower? Can't see it. Oh, shoot. Okay. Well, um, what about now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. So, so this is one of the flowers in that um, incredible moss bag. Um, you can see that they used uh, silver metal faceted beads which it, it must have just been so shiny and beautiful at the time. And uh, there's a flower on the right uh, there. Um, it has a very unusual sort of fringy end on it. And um, that is the flower that has helped us identify the work of this woman, uh, whoever she is, um, in other collections, because that's a very, very unusual way, uh, treatment for a flower. And um, But the, the masterful way that she has managed to turn that, the, the central section, which is divided into four, into uh, the eight little petals all the way around and have it all work out. Man, that, that is so hard. <laughs> so anyway, this many people have copied this flower. Uh, one of the scholars in residence uh, copied this flower and beaded some parts of the um, moss bag as a part of an essay about the 60s scoop. And her idea was that in the work of beating a moss bag, she was giving herself the intellectual space to recreate her indigenous childhood. It's, a, you know, it was a very powerful. And um, then uh, we had one other uh, student who uh, came along was just uh, really, um, a he, it's a he in this instance, um, beaded this flower onto a gift for his mother. And, um, and then, uh, then, yeah, let's see if I can get back again. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, the, and then, and then um, Daphne came along, and so I, I showed Daphne this beautiful thing, and she she took it, that idea and and, and ran with it. Um, and uh, I, if, you know, if it really you could not find a better instance of an object as a teacher than this beautiful moss bag. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I, uh, so, so, so I host lots of people all the time. And uh, perhaps, Michelle, you were there when I said this before. But I, 
I think that the Manitoba Museum Collection, which is the one I get to work with, has a very important role to play in um, helping people regain a sense of control over their identity and their cultural expression. And I often say, you know, that I hope someday people will say about the museum, ah, yeah, yeah, they have nice stuff, but we can make better things ourselves now. And um, I must say with all these artists that I worked with, that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> and it's so beautiful to see. Maureen, I think I should just mention that I don't think I ever would have had the courage to do that piece had you have not told me that you used the, the moss bag as a teaching tool. And, and, and we had that conversation whereby you said, um, well, these, these are, what, who else is there to teach you if you don't use these? And that was a real sense of empowerment for me. And it, it freed me in many ways. Um, so yes, thank you for that. Mm -hmm and for all of what you do to support the artists that you have fostered for so many years, decades. Well, thank you, it's my art. <laughs> I hope it others who are better it at it than art. I am. <laughs> yeah. It's so, so great to have Maureen at the table because, um, you know, we, we have talked, Bev talked about seeing things in, in collections and how important that was to her. Um, and uh, to, to be able to hear um, from the perspective of uh, the curators working with objects in museums, how, how those objects can be brought into relation and into conversation, as opposed to um, being sort of static things that you see in an empty room on a lonely visit to a museum has been really quite incredible. And, um, I am really excited to hear the three of you speak to each other. And I don't know if you need a prompt or not, you probably don't, but something that occurred to me as, as you each successively spoke was, um, of course I had sort of come to the table thinking about the inventiveness of Daphne and Bev's work, but um, inventiveness was an idea that uh, came forward really strongly in um, the three presentations, um, not just in terms of the work being made by the contemporary artists at the table, but in the work that you were looking at. And um, I just sort of realized how sort of um, uh, not, not linear um, this conversation is this is a circular conversation and by um, by contemporary artists looking back at this historical work it sort of brings that work forward into the contemporary realm and we understand um, the people who made them as as real innovators mm -hmm. I wonder if that is something that um, is an interesting idea to, to prompt a little bit of a conversation amongst you. Why don't you address that, Bev? Are you, is that something that you can speak to? Uh, could you go first? I'm sure. <laughs> I, don't want, I, I don't want to hog the mic. Um, I, I think that that is um, a key piece to resilience is in the idea of being inventive and being daring and um, not working kind of like my grandma was she didn't fall within the constraints of what the society dictated around her she pushed through it and um, I think that's really important for me personally particularly at this point that we're at in our history and I think it also was reflected in what what Laura Lee and Roger and I engaged in in the gallery that um, literally um, I, I, that lots of times you don't really know what you're doing you're 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 taking a, a, a leap of faith and it's really nice when you take a leap of faith when you want to if, if you're going to, to try new things it's really nice to be supported and have more than one head and you know more than two 
two hands. And um, I think that the Legacy Gallery gave me the opportunity to do that. And Maureen, you did as well through you know, the encouragement of, of creating the Moss Bag. Uh, and I think, I think we need to be bold right now. Uh, and this is, there's an opportunity to be bold. Uh, so yeah, I think, and, and we need to be inventive because it's obvious that the way we've been doing things historically have not worked. So hopefully there'll be new ways going forward. Sorry, I think I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. So you being in terms of like having actual access to collections and understanding um, how the like collections influence people or? Well, maybe, maybe for you, Bev, I can um, uh, add a little bit more um, of what, prompted this thought in in my head which was when when you showed the the moccasin pattern I was like holy crap that's brilliant and um I don't know when the pattern for making moccasins was was hit upon but it probably has been like you know nobody's had to fix it <laughs> it's probably um uh, been in use for a long time and it just like looking at that work in particular I thought like wow the person who came up with a moccasin pattern is just as much a conceptual thinker as as Bev Kosky is <laughs> which was really kind of an aha moment for me. Well, there are many different styles of moccasins, and that's one thing I didn't really realize until I started seeing works from like different collections and different groups of people and, you know, just like footwear in general, but there's, there are a lot of different styles. And the, the reason I have, I got that style is because I was able to um, call my friend Jean Marshall, who's an excellent, excellent beater and and the stuff that she makes and so fast and, and it's beautiful and, and beautifully just all the details are just perfect. Um, I was lucky enough that, you know, I could just call her, do you have, do you have the pattern of the one? And they're generally the ones that are from so, like around that region um, uh, as well. So it was, kind of, it was kind of convenient, but it's also kind of like these friendships. I met her through um, Banff, um, she's we both kind of known each other's families from the area and you know just the general kind of who works in beads and who doesn't but it's it is interesting um also watching her sort of <clears throat> work with the Thunder Bay Art Gallery now as well in terms of curating and you know doing stuff with her own work and and like how diligent she is on on you know working on like seeing designs, but then she kind of makes, she does make them hers, right? And she does kind of like add like speedy little tips to getting uh, moccasins finished as well. So it, it is interesting how people still, they still want moccasins. They still want all of these, all of these things that were considered kind of objects as well. I think one of the things that you instantly reject when you are confronted by the beadwork of the past is the idea of the distinction between craft and art. And craft, craft has always diminished women's work. But when you, like one of the things that we have in this collection is about 40 bandolier bags. The first thing I did when I got to the museum was photograph them all. And uh, so there I was about uh, six or eight months later with this DVD with 1,100 pictures on it of these. I photographed them from the point of view of a maker. What would a maker want to know about the joints, about the back, about everything? I was sitting there thinking, what do I do about this? And a woman walked in, phoned me up, and she, she said, uh, uh, her name is Joanne Soldier. She just got a Manitoba Arts Council grant to replicate a bandolier bag. Could I help her out? <laughs> just gave her all those pictures. And uh, she since brought her classes because she now teaches this to the museum we get all the bandolier bags out and they all look at them but then they go off and make them and you see them around town now but those bandolier bags are an example of 
a kind a piece that would formerly have been considered craft. They were initially there. They go over your shoulder and they're big, heavy things full of, you know, solid beads. Initially they had a pocket in them, but you know, we have never found anything in the pocket and uh, it, um, the pockets got smaller and smaller. And finally they just gave up on the pretense. And it's just, a, it looks like a bag, but there's no hole in it. And uh, men would go off to trade wearing two of these, one on each side. And um, I often thought, you know, these are women artists, you know, and if you don't have a wall, hang your art on the nearest man <laughs> and send him out into the world. <laughs> you know, he'll be sending a message. <laughs> this is my man. It will be the first one. But the other one will be, I can be better than you can. And, um, and I just think that we just have to stop thinking about craft as, uh, as, a, as um, a diminishing thing. And, and then do what you guys have done, which is to take that craft and tell new stories with it. And, and But the cr craft is like the skill of the art, not craft as a diminishing notion. Um, I, I, uh, so that's when I hear you talk about that sort of thing, that's what I'm thinking is that um, you just changed forever when you see how fabulous these pieces are. Um, I was in a... I had the opportunity to visit a lot of um, Native museum museums in in the U.S. Uh, a while back, and I was just you know minding my own business and collections, taking pictures with my really bad camera, and um, and they had all those drawers where all these zillions of pieces they had from collections all over North America. And I kept pulling and pulling and looking and looking designs and, and all these kind of things. And, and they are beautiful as objects, really beautiful as objects. And a lot of ways, you know, in those museums and especially the American museums, they get treated as if um, these, they're collections of items of a past that is, wants to be sort of just part of the past. It isn't really part of the future and or it's not considered part of the future it's not considered part of the history and as i was kneeling over um the, the this mother and child didn't see me and they weren't native and they walked by this display case of uh sort of like dolls that were made for either trade or maybe they were historic i'm not exactly sure because the stuff is older in those museums and the the young child says to her mother Indians have babies too. So for me, when you start thinking about the collections and the audiences, um, to me, there seems to be like there's a bigger question of what is like, it. it is a really interesting thing to know the craft, to learn the craft, to do all these things, but to make it just only indigenous, um, not like just totally indigenous, I'm not sure if I'm explaining this right, is kind of, is quite hard for me to totally, because you see, you know, with other cultures, they we collect all the historical things because, you know, we were in the States, it was the dying Indian, the whole kind of talk around all of that. But to me, I think that when people go into collections, especially, you know, not just a native art, but of any kind of art, there also have to be questions of how the stuff was, how the stuff got there um, what is the point of the museum doing? Uh, how much didactic stuff do you have to have with it? Like really, like at some point, you know, people just should be able to say, well, that's a moccasin or, you know, look, these people also had dolls too. You know, it's not like kind of like a condescending kind of thing of the past. And I think that with, you know, that there are aspects of it that are craft, but I also think that maybe there's, and I don't, there's a the whole notion of like art and craft and all the kind of, uh, you know, the talking of ideas around it. But I think that there's a, a better way to sort of be, not like just copying the items in museums, but kind of like generating the ideas and the discussions around how the stuff got into the museum, how it's made, you know, glass beads traveled everywhere. They aren't just indigenous, you know, like there's a whole sort of like world kind of history. I think that's to me really important to consider rather than just keeping it kind of in like our small little insular kind of um, 
uh, kind of thing. I just think that, that when I was growing up in my family, my dad was white, my mom was native, that I, my dad was always accepted by everybody in the family. It didn't matter, you know, they didn't go around chasing his identity or anything like that kind of stuff. We just, he was just part of the family He's, um, and all sort of that. And when I grew up, we were really, I don't, I always felt this kind of like acceptance of us being, you know, just, you're, you're kind of part of the group that knows what's going on. You know, you know what kind of racism you're going to get here, you're going to get this, you're going to get that. But when museums kind of get to that point where the collections are not kind of like addressed where, you know, I'm insulted by kids saying that Indians have babies too, right? There's, there's a bigger kind of like larger dialogue going on that I think that needs to be addressed other than us just, you know, making items people to look at. I really feel like that there could be more ideas around it. And, and it's not, it's just the way that I, I try to question all of these things. Like, where do the beads come from? I like, and you know, I did, I did a fair amount of research on it. I've had a chance to, you know, to go to Murano and see some glass making. I got to know about that history of it. Um, and to me, all those ideas are interesting about it. And to me about how looking at these collections is that it also shows the ingenuity of what people made to, to survive. And then at some point we're treating them like art objects. And uh, it doesn't always work for me in a way. I, I don't know how to explain it more than that. If I could just say something, it's interesting because we, right now art galleries are buying the sort of things that museums used to buy. Mm -hmm. mm. Sorry. Okay. And, um, and they have money too, which is really tough for us because we can't, we're not in that game at all. Yeah. But there's, you know, really important collections, really early stuff that are going to the National Gallery of Canada. And um, they are totally being brought into the world of art in, in doing that. And they will lose the family of other objects and those references once they go there, unless we work very hard to collaborate uh, between institutions. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's a, it's a good thing and it's a kind of an odd thing at the yeah, same time. Really the whole the ideas around collecting are, are so strange. And, and I'm coming from someone who's obsessively collects bead, beads. Like I, you can't see it, but I'm, there's this room's full of beads. So you could trip on them, they're everywhere. So, uh, yeah, it, it, there's just so many interesting ideas about that. And I think that, you know, kind of, you know, learning about the ideas collecting as well as, you know, loving these objects for how gorgeous they are, or just should be part of the dialogue, in my opinion. And, and I think maybe we could look at that in terms of the moss bag too, because Maureen, as, as you pointed out when I, when I saw it, and maybe most of you would know this, that the moss bag was never used. And the other works that were made by this woman's hand were also not used. So there's, these items were made for sale and they were treated as a collector's items. Um, I think the moss bag has three pinpoints on it, right, Maureen, where, where, <laughs> where it was hung on the wall. Um, and so at a time when probably the, um, the women may well have been the only breadwinners in the household, that they would have been making these objects for sale to keep the family fed. And in some the, cases, they still are. Yeah, <laughs> right yeah. Now. Yeah, for sure. But this was particularly after the collapse of the, you know, the buff, the buffalo, where the men weren't able to uh, uh, engage in trade as they had in the past. So I think that's where this is. This reflects an economy. It reflects the history. All of those things that you. Whoops, we can't hear you. You're, you're... <laughs> and all those things should be considered when when you're talking about objects like that, because they're they're interesting entry points for people to come in and learn more without it sort of being, you know, um, this is the only way it is. Like there's just so much more flexibility around the, the there should be around thinking and talking and how those things got there. In, in my opinion. So. Yeah, and that they, re that they reflect a time and a place and um, a currency. Uh, so I think you're right. There's it's it's a very complicated and and a reality that is ongoing today too. Lots of single moms raising their kids um, on their own. Mm -hmm. 
We're um, going to take questions from the audience in a, a minute. And maybe while we wait for those to appear, um, I'll just tell a little parallel um, anecdote, which maybe relates to this. Um, uh, I arrived at Ramey Modern and discovered that for strange reasons, there's a small collection of carvings from Papua New Guinea and um, two uh, African masks in the collection. At one point, the then director wanted to create a, a gallery of um, global indigenous art at the Mendel Art Gallery. And it, it never happened. Um, and because we have a large collection of Picasso prints, and um, I found myself assigned the task of putting together a Picasso show quickly. I looked at the influence of African and oceanic art on Picasso and brought out these objects from the vaults. And um, they are contextualized within a conversation about um, the complexities of why those objects are in art gallery in, in Saskatoon. and. Um, the uncertainty of their provenance and um, questions like that. And uh, I think in one of the text panels, I actually say, you know, as we learn about these objects, we'll have to face what it means for us to um, take the, on the responsibility of caring for them properly. And the subtext for me was, um, we might have to deaccession them or repatriate them or something like that. And um, it has been like really remarkable how important these two masks, African masks are in particular to Saskatoon's growing African um, community. And so many people have come to see those, those masks and have um, commented on how, how um, the museum feels so different to them that are able to see themselves reflected in those masks. So, I mean, the complexities about the conversation about uh, collections and what it means to collects just keeps spiraling in on itself in ways that I don't expect it to do. And um, uh, it is, I think, the most um, uh, interesting and, um, full of potential part of what we do in museums to be thinking about collecting. So, Laura Lee, are you? Sure. Um, taking the lead on these questions. Yes, I have a question from Leah Patterson. And Leah asks, could the artists speak to their experience in the respective collections slash museums they utilized to inform and learn about their work? Was there any, uh, was there respectful dialogue and were the, were they accommodated, were they accommodated as much as needed? So would anybody like to speak about their experience in collections and museums? Well, I can start because mine's been very short lived. <laughs> um, you know, starting in 2017 as an artist, I don't have a whole history of engagement. And um, so, yes, my first, my, the only time really that I ever engaged with a museum was through Maureen and, and the Moss Bag. And, um, you know, we, we that was a, a rich exchange. Uh, and I do think that, um, and also I wanna mention here as well, uh, because we're talking about engagement. And I think that Michelle, you hit on this a bit when you're talking about bringing people into the gallery, people coming to see works that in a context that they normally or would not have, um, have done. Laura Lee and I and Mel uh, uh, Greenlee hosted a series of tours of this exhibit. It was spurred um, brought on by the, um, one, an email that I received from an anonymous viewer who explained to me how much the work had meant 
to him and that um, he was brought to tears and that that um, it, it really gave him strength at a time when he was going through a really difficult moment. So and at that time, um, we the news of the Kamloops graves were was in so called news. And we were all very much impacted by that. And I felt myself going to a very dark place and said to Lori Lee, surely we can try and test to see whether in fact, this this work has the healing power that this person said in this email and Lori Lee then told me well yes it does and that was part of my curatorial um, uh, uh, perspective so we brought in we opened up um, just by word of mouth went this was not done through the internet but we hosted a whole series I'm not sure how many of them there were how many tours we had but we brought in people from the Victoria Native Friendship Center and um, any church that I knew of that had an um, Indigenous Studies program. And we filled all of our slots. And then we could have kept going right through to the end of the exhibit with um, groups of eight at a time, with people leaving saying that they had felt that they had had a really, a, a, a very deep experience. Lori Lee did a wonderful job of curating and bringing to life every piece of art in that show, spending an hour and a half often with a group walking us through. And I, uh, people left saying, I've walked by this gallery so many times, I don't know why I haven't come in. Um, and I have a feeling that, that they will be back. And that was, for me, that was a really empowering and powerful way to use the art and to engage in the community and something that I want to do going forward. So. Um, I'm trying to see the question. Was it written out or? Uh, well, I, I haven't had personally any, anything really, any two problems, any problems with art in a show really. <laughs> I think I'm just lucky or really fussy. <laughs> Everyone I've ever worked with, been, it's been really great. And if anything looks a little dodgy, I kind of just back away. <laughs> um, Laura Lee, I wanted to make sure that you had seen the question that's in the chat. I do, I see it. Christiane Smith. Um, is asking if Maureen could expand on her thinking um, about galleries uh, now acquiring contemporary Indigenous art rather than the museum. It's, um, um, I, I'm, I, I think it's wonderful that they're acquiring contemporary Indigenous art. What I was wondering about is like exactly what they're going to do with uh, really old things that they're collecting now that they're because the National Gallery of Canada, for instance, has a new a display of Canada's historic art. And it starts with beaded things. Um, I think they mostly come from the McCord uh, Museum, but they're they're actually acquiring things of their own now so that they can start to have these on exhibit. Um, it, this is not just the National Gallery. The, the Winnipeg Art Gallery has this wonderful new um, collection of Inuit art and a new exhibit space, but they have a lot of artifacts as well, you know, things that would be called an artifact parkas and so on. I, I don't doubt that they're art and I, I have no question with uh, grouping them together. I just think that you just want to think a little bit critically about how uh, an object which might have had another function in another era is being just kind of uncritically brought into the project of art because the, the impulse to call old pieces that might formerly have been called craft art now is an attempt to, to lift it up, to give it respect, to give it the respect it deserves. But um, there are also pieces that might have had ceremonial purposes that were never intended to be viewed in that way that are now admired for their technique or whatever. Um, it, it's not that it's like it's one of those things where it's a very it's, it's a it's a wonderful thing to interrogate them, but at a certain point you just have to think, hmm, who am I to ask that question? Am, am, am I am I 
taking this object and doing something with it that it doesn't, the object itself doesn't intend. And um, there was a fairly famous exhibit at one point about um, uh, Picasso and the African masks. And I think uh, one of the questions was, well, you know, like, what is the sort of European art project that they can just take a mask that had a formerly religious significance and say, hmm, looks like art to me. Um, you know, there was a very big debate, you guys will know this better than I do, within art history about the definition of art. And at one point, the definition was if somebody will buy it, it's art. And now it seems like a very cynical point of view and doesn't respect the relationships the object has had in the past. And so like my my interest in these objects as objects that make things happen is that over their history as a you can think of it almost as a biography they have had relationships and those relationships still are important you need to be able to think about the ceremonial relationships of an object you now admire as a work of art um, that object needs to have multiple ways of existing in the world and it, it you know art is only one of them those other possibilities those other relationships need to be left open Thank you, Maureen. Um, I don't see any other questions uh, in the chat or the Q&A right now. So um, are there any last thoughts, comments from, um, oh, ooh, we got a question here. A question for Michelle. You spoke of potentially repatriating items from the Mendel collection. In the absence of a Canada-wide repatriation policy, does the Mendel have or is planning to develop a repatriation process? And that is from Helen Demers. Um. I guess what I was what I was trying to um, convey was that we had brought these objects out of the vault for the first time in a very long time, and tried to present them in a transparent way that um, made it clear that we didn't have proper provenance for these works, and that um, I personally, um, but in my role as the chief curator at Ramey Modern, um, felt uncomfortable um, uh, not having the proper knowledge of, um, of these objects in the collection. And I had hoped that by bringing them forward, um, there might actually be a community challenge or information brought forward from the community that made it clear what path we had to set on um, in terms of caring for those works uh, more responsibly. Um, and I haven't been set on that path <laughs> because as I mentioned, it turns out that um, their presentation has been very, very well received. So I am um, going to, even though the show closes this Sunday, now that libraries and things are opening up, I can get into archives and understand a little bit more about the people who brought these works to Ramey Modern's collection and um, hopefully find some information that will make it clear whether um, they were brought there in a good way or not. It's entirely possible that they were works that were made for um, the tourist market. That could be one discovery and that um, they were purchased and um, everything was, was above board. So um, we are not planning on um, creating a, a standalone repatriation process. These are, we have, we have these 17 works, two African masks and 15 works from Papua New Guinea. Um, I think that 
that kind of work should be led by a museum, not by a modern and contemporary art gallery. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you to our audience for participating in our programming for On Beaded Ground. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Um, I am just so grateful to all of you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I hope you all have a really good evening. Um, Amy has posted the uh, survey link in the chat. Um, and uh, stay tuned for our final uh, programming event uh, next Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time um, to uh, partake in a bead and bitch hosted by uh, Dana Danger and Nico Williams. And that conversation will be moderated uh, by uh, Eli Hurdle, who is the Indigenous Curator at Open Space. So thanks, everybody. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Laura Lee. And thank, thank you, you Laura Lee. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All. Nice thank to meet you, Bev. Yeah. Nice to meet you. And Michelle, too. Maureen, yeah. See you soon. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye, bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.